Death Stranding. Leave it to Kojima to make a game where throwing your own feces at ghosts is an actual mechanic. The latest in our line of EX grenades. I give you the number two. As you may have surmised, this model was produced with various extracts refined from your fecal matter. Shields up, Iron Breakers. We're kind of here coming at you with another video, and today I'm bringing you my Death Stranding review. This title was sent to me by PlayStation Portugal, so I could give it a look and tell you guys my opinions on it. And I know right now a lot of you are wondering exactly what to expect from Death Stranding, and today is the day you're going to be hunting for answers. This is why I made posts on Twitter and YouTube asking you for all the questions you might have about this game, and hopefully by the end of this video you will have your answers. But for now, let's get things started with visuals and audio. Death Stranding features some of the most impressive and realistic visuals I've seen on the PlayStation 4 so far, particularly if your TV supports HDR. Now I'm not Digital Foundry and as such I don't have the tools or the knowledge to go in depth into all the visual features or frame rates. I can tell you the game is targeting 30 FPS and it manages to maintain it for the most part at 1080p. However in 4K I did notice the occasional frame drop, nothing game breaking mind you, particularly because they mostly occurred during cutscenes. Now, the attention to detail and care that was placed in the characters, the equipment, the locations you visit, and the world itself is simply breathtaking. You're breathtaking! The dynamic weather effects between the different regions you visit are also worthy of mention, as are the protagonist's reaction to these changes through contextual animations. The story cutscenes are also on another level, with every minuscule detail of the actor's expressions being represented on screen, granting the player constant clues into each character's motivations. This is also helped by the excellent cinematography, the camera work, and framing of the scenes, which has a distinct Kojima feel. To wrap things up, let's just say that in terms of visuals, the game definitely delivers. Pun intended. In terms of audio, it's also a superb experience, from Sam's footsteps to the sound of the reverse trike, gunfire, BT encounters, or even just the rain hitting your cargo while you're holding your breath to prevent detection. Everything sounds just like you'd expect. While the soundtrack is not really up my alley, it is most definitely appropriate for the feelings the game is trying to evoke from the player. When it comes to voice acting, it's also solid. The actors did a splendid job of delivering their lines in what I would consider an excellent performance. Now, do I get extra likes for the double pun? I'm not getting involved with you or anyone else ever again. Wait. See, it's like I'm not even here. Same as it ever was. Sam! Sam! Speaking of performance, I guess it's as good a segue as any to talk about the story and plot of Death Stranding. Now, due to the complexity of the narrative and my desire to allow the players to experience the story firsthand spoiler free, this portion of the video is going to be intentionally vague. At some point in the future, humanity suffers a massive disaster referred to as Death Stranding. This event caused the global communications infrastructure to collapse, essentially isolating the cities of America. It was also the catalyst to the eventual discovery of the beach, which is essentially an alternate dimension where your soul goes after you die. The sequence of events is significantly more complex, but essentially the path that leads us to the discovery of the beach also revealed ways in which we could gain potential benefits from combining our technology with the beach, and thus the chiral network was born. Think of it as a supernatural internet powered up by this alternate dimension. Now, the Death Stranding also caused a lot more problems, such as Timefall, which is a rain that essentially speeds up the passing of time for anything it touches. So if a human was to shower in Timefall, they would essentially experience rapid aging. But this also affects inanimate objects, so metal, for instance, would rust and deteriorate much faster than normal. 
Another problem caused by the death stranding is that people can't die properly anymore. If their bodies aren't burned soon after death, their souls return from the beach as BTs, which are essentially ghosts that can kill you and cause major catastrophes. BTs are usually found in time falls. I know. Sounds pretty wild, and now you're wondering, what the hell does any of this even have to do with the game? Think of it like this. The Death Stranding destroyed global communications, essentially isolating cities across America. It caused the time fall phenomena, as well as the appearance of BTs. But it also provided us with the technology to reconnect the cities again through the chiral network. Now, our character Sam suffers from a condition which puts him in a unique position to reconnect the cities of America through the chiral network. He is able to sense BTs, which are actually invisible to the naked eye. And he is a repatriate, which basically means he's able to return from the seam after he dies. The seam being where you go before your soul transitions into the beach. It's, it's kind of like a purgatory. Shortly after you begin the game, your objective becomes to reconnect the cities and people of America under the chiral network. And this is about as much as I am willing to reveal of the plot. Now, I know some other outlets will look into embargo loopholes to reveal more, but since the story was actually what I liked the most about Death Stranding, I'd rather leave the rest for the players to experience themselves. I will say though, the beginning of the story felt somewhat impenetrable, with constant terms being thrown at you like BTs, Timefall, Beaches, Dooms, BBs, etc. All I can say is that stuff starts to make sense the more you play, but it does demand you pay close attention to pretty much every dialogue. Beyond the explicit narrative you experience throughout the gameplay and cutscenes, there's also a wealth of information that's made available to you in the form of NPC emails and character interviews. However, this is all in text format, and if you want to know more about the world of Death Stranding, you'll need to dedicate some time to reading all of this information. Most of it isn't really essential to understanding the main narrative, though. So now you're wondering, all right, I know the plot, what's the gameplay like? How do we go about actually reconnecting these cities? And this is the part where I think I will crush a lot of people's dreams, because the main bulk of your gameplay does revolve around you making deliveries. I don't know how many of you have played space trucking games where you travel from station to station, making deliveries and then buying modules that allow you to haul more cargo or make your ship go faster, or better lasers to defend your ship with. The concept here is pretty much the same. You make deliveries of critical supplies to different locations in the game world. And as you make these deliveries, you bring these locations into the chiral network, constantly expanding the UCA, or the United Cities of America. As you complete these deliveries, you'll receive a rating on the quality of your service. This takes into account the amount delivered, because sometimes you might lose cargo, the state the cargo is in, if it has been damaged in the trip, how fast you perform the delivery, etc. The better the rating you get, the more likes you're going to get from the client, which essentially raises your connection level with that client. This is important because some of those clients provide you with upgrades like better boots or exoskeletons that make your job easier, or even weapons to defend yourself. More on those later. But basically, the better you get at delivering cargo, the more tools the game will reward you with that make that job easier. If you receive a piece of gear you really like, doing optional deliveries for that client may eventually get you upgraded versions of that item. And there's enough optional deliveries to keep you playing this game well into 2020, so completionists be warned. Now, what's unique about Death Stranding is that as you go along making your deliveries, you have the option to create an infrastructure that will make the trip easier between the two locations you are making deliveries for. For example, let's say there's two rivers and a mountain between two way stations where you are running deliveries. The first time you climb the mountain, you might put a climbing anchor on top of the mountain with a rope. So next time you need to climb it, you can use the rope and it's going to be faster. Let's say the rivers are getting annoying to cross because they slow you down. You can put a ladder down or even build a bridge to cross through those rivers faster. Naturally, these things will scale as you advance in the game, to the point where you'll eventually be building sections of highways in order to optimize your delivery routes. And now you say, highways? So there's vehicles? 
Yes, there are vehicles which you can use to expedite your deliveries, but the terrain is notoriously difficult to navigate outside of roads, so sometimes they are more of a hindrance than a useful tool. That still didn't stop me from taking my reverse trike everywhere, though. Now, before we move into other mechanics, I'd like to discuss some of the multiplayer features since they are extremely relevant to the infrastructure I mentioned previously. There's two ways to play Death Stranding. You can play it offline or you can play it online. The game will default you to online and when you are playing in that mode, you'll see other players' structures populate your world just like your own structures will eventually show up in someone else's world. Now, while you can place ladders and climbing anchors pretty much anywhere, the building of bridges, generators, timefall shelters, and other relevant structures can only be done in regions which have joined the chiral network. So the first time you walk into an area, you won't see any structures from other players, but you might find the occasional ladder or rope. When I initially began to see structures from other players in my world, I immediately turned off the online component because I began to feel that I wasn't in control of my own exploration of the world. I feared I would be following in the footsteps of other players and they had already laid the groundwork that allowed me to traverse the world with ease. But after experimenting further with the online component, I realized my fears were unjustified. Yes, the game does bring structures from other players into your world, but it never brings the entire solution. So for instance, imagine there's three rivers between two locations you're traversing. The game might bring in a bridge another player has created, but it will never bring all three, thus forcing you to complete the remaining bridges if you want to, at which point your own bridges will be sent to the worlds of other players. It actually provides a very interesting feeling of community where you use your own structures to complement other structures that may have appeared in your world. Now, in my case, most of these structures were from complete strangers, with the exception of a couple of Yong Yaz constructions, one of which almost got me killed, so thanks for that, Yong. However, I imagine the system is designed for prioritizing your friends list, so if you have friends that are playing, I believe the game would prioritize those structures to show up in your world, which would make the online aspect that much better. I would actually advise anyone playing to keep the online feature on, because further ahead when you are working on highways, the material contributions from other players will save you a lot of grinding. I genuinely believe the game was designed to be played as a community experience, and going at it solo might end up being much less enjoyable. But the option is there, the game does not require an always online connection, and everything can be experienced in single player. However, I do suspect it will take you considerably longer to progress through certain areas of the game. And I can already hear that raging question bubbling up in your minds. What about the combat? Is there any combat in this delivery simulator? So how about it? Aren't you getting tired of the grind? Isn't this what you've been waiting for this whole time? A game over. And the answer is yes, there is combat, but there's a reason why I haven't mentioned it up until this point. And that reason is because combat was actually a very small part of my playthrough. And this isn't necessarily by choice. You know I don't shy away from combat, but I would argue that the game's mechanics actively discourage combat with the exception of the boss fights. Your main objective during the game is to make deliveries and you get rated on the quality of your deliveries. Getting involved in combat is basically risking damaging your goods or having them stolen. You can unload your goods to engage in combat, but I didn't like the idea of dropping my cargo just to go out of my way to stun a couple of enemies. Because you're not actually supposed to kill anyone. Remember that whole part in the story where I talked about how people don't die anymore, they just return as BTs? So if you were to slaughter a couple of people because they got in your way, you would then have to transport their corpses to the nearest incinerator or they would eventually go necro and the next time you need to go through that area it will be crawling with BTs and those will give you a much harder time than human enemies. Then there's also the potential for time fall while you're engaged in combat which further damages your cargo. There's the time you spend in combat which makes your delivery slower. Certain enemies might actually steal cargo from you. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong with engaging in combat while on a delivery run. And throughout 80% of the game, I had cargo to deliver on me. 
Now, there's also missions that actually require you to infiltrate enemy camps and retrieve stolen cargo, and in those cases, you can engage in combat all you like or use stealth if you so choose. There's also other reasons to raid enemy camps. As I mentioned previously, certain structures require materials to build. You can get these materials by either completing deliveries, looking for them in lost packages out in the open world, or by raiding enemy camps. When confronted with the need for materials, there were quite a few occasions where I infiltrated enemy camps, knocked them all out, stole one of their own trucks, and cleaned out their stock of materials. And that, I must say, is quite satisfying. In terms of engaging in combat when you start the game, you only have a rope to deal with enemies, which essentially pushes you more towards a stealth approach. But eventually they give you a bola gun, which you can use to immobilize enemies and then knock them out with a kick. And unlike Metal Gear, when you knock out an enemy, you don't really have to worry about them getting back up, at least not in normal difficulty. As you progress further into the game, you'll get other weapons that allow you to be more effective at taking out enemies. This includes both lethal and non-lethal alternatives. Now, so far I've only talked about combat with other humans, but then there's also BT encounters, and as you advance through the story, you'll have to tackle quite a few of these. BTs, or beach things, are invisible, but when Sam is connected to his BB, or when Reedus has the fetus, he's able to see BTs if he's close enough to them. That's the purpose of that device on his shoulder. It points towards the nearest BT and gives you a rough indication of how close it is. After you get close enough, you'll need to decide how to deal with it. You're either going to attack or move around it. Your first option includes grenades fashioned from Sam's bodily fluids, which essentially make the BTs move around, giving you openings to get past them but eventually you'll get weapons that allow you to actually destroy BTs. And at that point, I must admit, I started taking out BTs left and right whenever I got into a BT encounter, because here's the thing about BT mechanics. When they come in touch with you, they'll drag you towards the biggest BT in the vicinity. And in the process, they'll spread your cargo all over the place. And after that, you'll engage in a boss fight against that BT. And that might actually consume quite a few of your anti-BT arsenal. Speaking of boss fights, there are several of those as you advance through the story. And while they aren't particularly groundbreaking, they provide a much needed change of pace between all the delivery runs you do throughout the game. In case you're wondering how the combat feels, everything is solid. The shooting, the stealth takedowns, the melee, the grenades, and everything in between. I have no complaints about the combat itself, but... I would have liked an option to auto-discard used items. Because here's the thing, during combat you will use up items like blood bags, guns, grenades, etc. And even after they are used up, they remain on your character as empty items because they can be recycled for materials. However, in a combat situation, the last thing you care about is what you'll do with empty items. In fact, I never once cared about empty items, even when outside of combat, and always discarded them, because the space they take up is a complete waste and just not worth the recycling materials. So essentially this means that during combat, sometimes you'll be forced to pause in order to do inventory management and discard used items so that you can pick up fresh supplies and continue the fight without having a huge pile of cargo boxes on your back. So far, I've been focusing on explaining the plot and the gameplay mechanics because I want to make sure you understand what the game is like due to all the mystery surrounding this title. But now I'm going to be focusing on my personal opinion in regards to Death Stranding. And the first thing I have to say is, this game is definitely not for everyone. In fact, if running deliveries and building an infrastructure to optimize your ability to do those deliveries doesn't sound appealing to you at all, this game is not for you. Now, interestingly enough, due to my past experience with Elite Dangerous, I actually enjoy doing this kind of stuff. Optimizing loadouts to make a delivery, building the infrastructure to ensure I can return to each location easily. I found the gameplay enjoyable, and I cannot emphasize the community aspect of the game enough. When you use a structure that another player has made that happens to help you out in a pinch, and then you further contribute by providing your own structures which you know will facilitate someone else's playthrough, there's definitely a feel-good, pay-it-forward vibe that resonated with me. 
Having said that though, not everything is inverted rainbows and roses. And I should mention that the world feels pretty empty when you're out making deliveries. You might encounter the occasional enemy camp or BT infested timefall, but most of the friendly NPCs are inside shelters. And most of your interactions with other characters are during deliveries and they don't even leave their shelters to collect the cargo. You just drop it off in an elevator shelf and they communicate with you via hologram. And while I do enjoy the gameplay loop, even I got tired of running deliveries all over the place from time to time, at which point I would simply beeline the main story deliveries and slacked on the infrastructure work, which would lead to sloppier delivery scores, but at some point, after you've run through the same three locations multiple times and know all of the challenges of each route, you're just going through the motions and it's fairly easy to burn out. And that, in my opinion, is the game's biggest flaw, the repetitive nature of the main gameplay loop. Braving the difficulties of a region during your first delivery is fun and engaging. Repeating those same difficulties multiple times because maybe you didn't have the materials to streamline the route or that particular region isn't in the chiral network yet is a recipe for quick burnout. And in those moments, you'll be glad you're playing online because you might actually encounter part of someone else's infrastructure to make your job a little easier. In contrast, the game's biggest asset is definitely its narrative. I greatly enjoyed the game's story, the plot twists, character development, the setting, the set pieces, and the storytelling. You can tell a lot of care went into the world building and character interactions during the cutscenes. I also think the overarching theme of connecting people is very well implemented with the game's multiplayer functionality of sharing each other's structures as you advance through the game. The game isn't perfect. It has flaws, and for many Kojima fans, I'm sure this is not what they wanted or expected, but I definitely think there's something special in that Stranding, and I really appreciate seeing a studio that is willing to take chances in order to produce something different. This is not a game for everyone, and that's a good thing in my book, because when you set out to make a game for everyone, you end up making a game for no one. Now, due to the mysterious nature surrounding this title, I ask you guys to send me any questions you had in regards to Death Stranding. And in this section of the video, I'm going to try to answer some of those questions I feel weren't covered in the review. How long is the game? Well, it took me around 50 hours to beat, but I also did quite a few optional deliveries, although I also left quite a few of them behind. So someone who is beelining the main story could potentially finish it a lot faster, like 30 hours or so for their first playthrough. Is it fun? If my description of the gameplay sounded fun to you, then yes. If what you really wanted was the next Metal Gear, then no. I liked it. How is the replayability? As far as I'm aware, there is no New Game Plus functionality, but after you wrap everything up, the game allows you to go back and engage with the open world so you can run more deliveries, infiltrate more camps, build slash maintain infrastructure, and explore things you might have missed. But beyond that, I don't think there is much more. Is there a progression system similar to Metal Gear Solid 5? In a way, yes. As you increase the range of the chiral network, you unlock new technology. This means exoskeletons, grenades, weapons, new structures you can build, etc. You'll be unlocking new tech all the way until you finish the game, and I believe even after it if you choose to continue playing. I mostly play Monster Hunter and Dark Souls. Will I like this game? Probably not, unless my description of the gameplay sounds appealing to you. And that's pretty much it for this video. Hopefully I've cleared up any questions you might have in regards to Death Stranding. I'll be live streaming some more gameplay on the 7th of November. So if you are still on the fence, join me then and hopefully I can show you more. But also feel free to ask me anything in the comment section and I'll do my best to answer as much as I can. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this review, consider leaving a like. If you didn't enjoy it, leave a dislike. Feedback is always welcome. If you enjoy my content, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell. And YouTube might send you a notification next time there is a void out or something. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong and may your shields never break.
And all it'll take is one itty bitty void out to blow us all to kingdom come.